we're going to move on today to ask the question that they asked. What shall we do? That was what they cried out. It wasn't just something that they uttered in a very um, low voice. It was a cry from the very soul, from the very depth of their being. What shall we do? But I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 19. As we look at the depth of this question. Matthew 19 verse 16 through 22. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good Master, speaking of Jesus, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if you will enter eternal life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do, do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear witness, uh, false witness, honour thy father and mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. Oh, what yet do I lack? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Notice the difference in question here from this man. <clears throat> We have the question from these men on the day of Pentecost. What shall we do, brothers, men? What shall we do? What do we need to do to be saved? But this man says this. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Notice that he called Jesus master or teacher. They didn't call him Lord. What good thing shall I do? And he also said, all these things I have kept from my youth up. What do I lack? Ever since that first sin, mankind has had this inbuilt notion that me must do something. To present themselves before God as acceptable. Genesis 3, we know, don't we? That the, the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened. They knew that they were naked before they, they didn't, they had no problem with it. They walked around, they were created that way, there was no issue, no problem with their nakedness together. And yet as soon as they sinned, all of a sudden it was... They needed to cover themselves up. This is not just about embarrassment about their bodies. There's more to it than this. They had lost their covering. Who was their covering? God is their covering. And all of a sudden they were naked. And it says in Genesis 3, 7. That the eyes were opened. They realised that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. See the words there? They made themselves aprons. They tried to cover their own sin. They tried to cover their own nakedness, which they had lost. They'd lost their covering of Christ, of God himself. They'd lost that. So what was the first thing that they did? They tried to fix the problem themselves. And so they got leaves and sewed them together to try and cover their parts their embarrassment, their nakedness. We know, of course, that that wasn't going to do. And it was God himself that gave them a covering of skins, which alludes to that first great sacrifice. You don't get skins from nowhere. Something has to die. He made them clothes of skins. 
and covered them. Again, we see in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, we've got a group of men where Jesus alludes to them. He says, many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name or in your name cast out devils and in your name done wonderful works? Then Jesus says, I will profess unto them, I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Again, we see the same thing. Lord, can we come into your kingdom? Why, why are you rejecting me? Have we not done these things for you? Have I not prophesied the whole of my life in your name? Have, have we not cast out demons? Have we not raised the dead? Have we not done so many wonderful works in your name? Sorry, I don't know who you are. You are workers of iniquity. Why? Because they always reference to what it is that they did. Have we not? Look at all the great things we've done for you. Is that an entrance to the kingdom of God? Surely, if I've lived my whole life doing all these works for you, then that door's going to swing wide open for me. But he says, I don't know who you are. Not only that, <clears throat> depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Romans 7, 18 tells us that in me, Paul says, in me, speaking of himself, that is my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. All these people then are alluding to what they've done. I'll clothe myself, I'll try and hide the sin that I've committed. I'll make fig leaves, I'll cover my nakedness. Oh, have, is it... All these things that we've done, Lord, are they, not, are they not ticking the boxes? Are they not a key to enter through your door? Have we not done enough? And Paul says, there's nothing that does good in me. I can't present myself to God. Look at me. That's what they're saying. Look at me. I'm good enough, surely. The Pharisees then, they thought that they were in good stead before God. Because of their observances to traditions, to the feast, to the ceremonial cleansings, for example. And yet, what did Jesus call many of these people? Whitewashed tombs. Full of dead men's bones. What did he mean by that? Well, they used to whitewash the tombs. They looked really pure. They looked clean. They looked nice. You could see them. They even sometimes had markers on them that told you was buried there and what they'd done. But inside them, they were just full of bones, full of death. And that's what he said. You look pure on the outside. You look clean. You look the part. But inside, you're just full of death. That's what these religious Pharisees were, but they thought they were in good stead with God just because of all the ceremonies they did and the cleansings and the, the traditions of men. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, for by grace you are saved, through faith. Yeah. Now that, not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We, we see, don't we, Paul, in his description, he, he, he speaks of himself. He says, look, if anybody can boast, I can boast. The Hebrew of Hebrews, a man who has, you know, studied under Gamaliel. Top of my game. Pharisee. Probably the top. Probably nobody better than me, in that sense. Nobody is studious. Nobody is passionate. Nobody is zealous for the Pharisaical way of life. And yet, what did he say about those things? I count them all 
as dregs, as dung, as refuge. Cast them all away into the bin. I don't count them as anything. Romans 11, 5 and 6 says, Even so, at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Speaking of the Jews. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So he asked this question, what good should I do? What, what is it? I've got to be able to do something. <clears throat> but he goes on, he says, what, what do I lack? What? I've done all these things. I've kept all these commandments from my youth up. I've done this. I've done what you've asked me, Jesus. So, so what do I lack? All these things have I kept from my youth. And in effect, what he's saying is, I've kept my end of the deal. I've done these things. I've done my bit. I, I've surely I've ticked the right boxes. And perhaps he did. Outwardly. But we see that the deeds of the law in Romans 3 says, The deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. For by law is the knowledge of sin. That's what the law was given for. The law was never going to save. Never intended to save. It was there to show us just how wicked and sinful we were. What did Paul say in Romans 7? If the law about covetousness hadn't been there, I wouldn't have known that I was a coveter. So what it did, it brought it all out into the open. And it showed to us the reality just how dead we actually are in sin. But these people, you see, they thought that by doing and acting and fulfilling and dotting every uh, I and crossing every T of the law, that that was going to be the entrance into heaven. But Jesus says no. <coughs> the law was all to do with bringing out the sin of our lives. What do I lack? What shall we say then, Romans 7? Is the law sin? God forbid, if I had not known sin, but by the law, I've just said this, I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. I would have known what lust is, if the law had not told me it was wrong. Galatians 3 says, is the law then against the promises of God? Galatians 3, 21 through 25, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, he says it again. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin. That the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to show us our need, to show us our sin, to show us what we needed in Him. That we might find Christ. That we might be justified not by the law, but by faith. Faith in Him. It was to lead us to Him. So he says, what do I lack? What would be the answer? He doesn't, seemingly doesn't lack the works. He lacks faith. He obviously wasn't justified by faith. He was trying to justify himself by his works in the law. This man, it goes on to tell us in verse 22 of Matthew 19 that he had great possessions. And then the question that we can ask there then is what is on the throne 
of the heart. We know what was on his. See, this question of his, what do I lack? It's plainly a question of doing outward works from a self-righteous and a pharisaical heart. He must have thought that actions alone were adequate. But what did he expect Christ's answer to, answer to be? Did he expect it to be a parting of himself from his possessions? Did he really expect that? I don't think he did. I don't think he knew that Jesus was going to turn around to him and say, look, you need to go, you need to give all your wealth away. I don't think he would have asked him, I don't think he would have gone to him if he'd have known he was going to say that. I think what he expected was that Jesus was just going to tell him some other form of ceremony or some form of tradition that he needed to adhere to. Go and do this, go and do that. So that he could just go away feeling justified in ticking another box. But the reality is that his possessions were his God. And that he had, in fact, broken the very first commandment. He said, I've adhered to these commandments from my youth up. What's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And yet he did. He stumbled at the very first hurdle. And he was found to be wanting. There are examples of this pharisaical self-righteousness. I'm going to read to you a couple Luke 7, 36 through 39. And one of the Pharisees, it says, desired Jesus that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he sat down to meet. And behold, the woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at his feet behind him weeping. Began to wash his feet with tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head. And kissed his feet. And anointed them with the ointment. <clears throat> now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it. He spake within himself saying. This man if he were a prophet. Would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. This is, I believe his name is Simon the leper, who was a Pharisee, who had invited Jesus to his house, and Jesus went, of course, not to be influenced by him and the Pharisaical <coughs> way of living, but to be the influencer. And this woman comes along with so much sin, So much wickedness of her life. And yet look what she did. She broke in, in a sense. I mean, these people often met outside in the courtyard to eat in this way. And they sat low with their feet behind them. So that she was quite able to get behind. Poured out this expensive ointment. Smashed this box, broke the ointment, poured it all over him, wept at his feet, kissed his feet, wiped his feet with the hair. It's a really beautiful way of looking at repentance and the worship of God. And yet all this man could see was a sinner. And you know, we do look at people, don't we, sometimes and see sinners. And we look at ourselves and see sinners. But we as Christians, by God's grace, recognise that we're sinners. This man didn't. He looked at her and judged her. And he said of Jesus, if you knew what kind of woman this was, you'd have nothing to do with her. You'd send her away. Was Jesus in the habit of sending people away who came to him? She had a repentant heart. She may have been a wicked sinner. But he was a greater one. The self righteous, arrogant, prideful Pharisee. And she went away, I believe, 
justified and forgiven of a sin. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So he did this purposely. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much of his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that has exalted himself will be abased, and he that has humbled himself will be exalted. Again, you see the same thing. Oh, look at me. I'm, I'm not like all these people. I don't, I don't lust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not unjust. I tithe of my, my earnings. I fast twice a week. I tick all those boxes. I'm so glad that I'm not like this fellow. Would that it be that he was. Because he was the one that went away justified. But again, you see this pharisaical, self-righteous attitude. Lastly, John 8, verses 31 through 34. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. Why do you say you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly I say unto you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Once again, the attitude of the Pharisees speaking to the Messiah, saying, we're not slaves. Why do we need to be free? And Jesus himself is saying that whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And friends, that encapsulates every one of us. Jesus warns us in Matthew 5 verse 20. I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. If our righteousness does not exceed the ones that I have just been speaking of, then we won't enter heaven. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is a phenomenal sermon that needs to be looked at and looked at and looked at. Some very strong words of Jesus in that text. When he says, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you won't enter heaven. So then being a rich man, perhaps, like Simon Magnus, we know of Simon Magnus, he thought that he could buy his way into the kingdom. That he could use his wealth as that good thing that he could do. How many of us have dreamt of having greater wealth so that we could do great things for God? I, I have. I admit it. If I just had that bit more, if I just had this money that I could, you know, I could build that better church or I could make this a better thing or that a better thing. Or I could perhaps help that person out that I don't really need it. And it isn't even about the fact that those things are, are necessarily in and of themselves a bad thing. But when it becomes about measuring our works and what we do against God and his law and the faith that we should have in Christ, 
None of the works that we ever do in this life are going to have any credit with God. I can stand here, uh, preach the gospel, and I can look at somebody like George Whitfield or, or Charles Wesley or John Wesley or Charles Spurgeon or all these people that we know, and I can weigh myself up against them. I can look at people who have gone into other countries and, and revolutionised places like uh, Hudson Taylor and people of the like. But those people would stand with me and their claim to the throne of grace, their claim to enter heaven would be one thing. And that it would be faith in Christ and his work on the cross. Not all that they'd done, not all that they'd achieved, not the counting of souls saved. Not how many things that they did in these foreign countries. Because our works do nothing. Our works come from the fact that we're saved. They don't count towards it. Truth is that even if we speak, even if we did speak in the tongues of men and angels, even if we prophesy, even if we preach, even if we have all faith and all knowledge, even if we give all we have to the poor and give our bodies to be burned, even offer up that good thing that we can do. Without Christ on the throne of our hearts, without that love that is from him and in turn toward him, whatever our great possessions are, whatever our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So we come to this cry, come back to this cry of these men in Acts 2.37. Men, brethren, what shall we do? Here we find ourselves ravished by guilt, torn asunder, hearts broken, minds destroyed, everything we've ever known. What shall we do? See, this cry, this is different to that of the rich young man. These two were religious men. In Acts chapter 2 verse 5, tells us that they were devout men out of every nation under heaven. They weren't ignorant of God's law. They weren't ignorant of the promised coming Messiah. They too had no doubt lived with the self-righteous attitude of the Pharisees. But something was different. Something had changed. The trust that they had in themselves and the trust that they had in the law had suddenly been ripped away. Why? Because they heard. Because they heard the truth. God had unstopped their ears. God had circumcised their hearts. <clears throat> pierced them through with a deep knowledge of their sin. What sin? Well, they hadn't been charged with idolatry or stealing or fornication or adultery, not even breaking the Sabbath. They hadn't been charged with dishonouring their parents or covetousness, for example. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit <coughs> upon the word of God that Peter had preached. Through that, their eyes have been washed in the salve of heaven. Their hearts run through by that double-edged sword of his word. And through this, these men, these 3,000 souls saw that they were lost. They saw that they didn't know God. They were devout in religion. And let me just say this. 
Let us not be found there. Let us not be found there. Let us not be found in religion. As they were. The entirety of their life. That's all they knew. They were devout in religion. And yet they found that they didn't know God. They found that their profession of God was without substance. They saw that they were unrighteous. <clears throat> they saw that professing to be wise, they become fools. They saw that their sin had been found out. They realised that their hearts were cold, black and hard. They perceived that they were dead in trespasses and sin. That all their lives up until this point, there had been no fear of God before their eyes. They saw that they had fallen short of the glory of God and that neither the law nor good works could save them. That even being a descendant of Abraham guaranteed them absolutely zero. Realised that they had rejected Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That they even murdered their Messiah. That they had sacrificed their Saviour. They came to the conclusion that they were guilty. That they were debtors who had no way of paying And when they heard, they saw that they were sons of hell. Yeah. They were weighed, measured, and found wanting. Yeah. But the judge was standing at the door. And they were destitute and without hope in the world. And they realised all these things, they saw all these things pierced through into the depths of their souls. Then, it was then, that this desperate cry, men, and not just men, but brothers, what must we do? What can we do? Imagine the hopelessness that they had. Everything that they knew, the whole religious life that they lived, had been like, ripped like a rug from underneath them. And they saw all these things. And they, were, they saw that they were dead. They were helpless and hopeless. So then when you look, when you read this scripture, and you see that they cried out, man, what should we do? You get a better grip on it. And it isn't just words that we read in Acts chapter 2. That there was a desperation behind all of this. What shall we do? I don't know if you've heard of a man called Jonathan Edwards. That on the 8th of July in 1741 in a place called Enfield in Massachusetts preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. There's a quote here. It says, Edwards got up and read his manuscript you see how this is written. He pretty much just read it out. The people were literally clinging to the pillars and pews, trying to keep themselves from sliding down to hell immediately. It had that kind of effect on people. He preached this message and he preached it in Enfield and people were literally clinging to pews because they thought the floor was opening up to, to, to suck them into hell. Now we preached it again in other places and never had the same effect. Do you understand these people were clinging to the pews, hanging on for dear life because the flames of hell were licking their feet? Mm. This is what these men were facing when they cried, men and brothers, what mm. should we do? They were being sucked down into darkness. 
like Cora and his family. So what has been the cry of our own hearts? What have we been like? Have we liked those Jews and the Pharisees? Have we convinced ourselves of a good standing before God because of our traditions? Because of our Christian heritage? Or the renown of our Christian family name and reputation? What about our church attendance? What about our involvement in everything that the church does? Do we think for one moment that any of that is going to secure us a place in heaven? That it does us any favours before God? Have we found ourselves laid bare? That the nature of our sin and wickedness is spread out before our very eyes. Just like these people. Have we been left helpless in a desperate state of terror? Knowing deeply that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Have we cried out with these men? What shall we do? Have we found ourselves there? What on earth am I going to do? Do you belong to Christ today, friends? You might think, come on, you know that we're Christians. Maybe. Maybe not. Only you can answer that. Only you know where you stand before Christ. Only you know if you're just devout. Only you know if you're a church attendee. Only you know if you're basing your salvation on everything you do for church. But if you belong to Christ today, if all that you do, all that you are, is based upon your confession, Christ is your righteousness, that he is the one that died to pay the price of your sin, no matter whether your works outweigh someone else or theirs outweigh yours. That it's him. Look unto me and be saved, it says in Isaiah 45. Look to me. If you belong to Christ today, whether you've come to the knowledge of your sin, your great need immediately, like these men do, all of a sudden, something changed and they knew and they saw and they were desperate. Maybe that happened to you. Maybe the person next to you has been progressive. And you come to know really what you are before God on a basis of bit by bit, time by time. Well then give him the praise he deserves. Worship him not only in word and song, but with your whole life. Live holy for him. But also, I must say this, if this morning you know, and again, not based upon how long you've been coming to this church or your family name, or whether all your family is known in the area for being Christians, if you know, in the very depth of your being that you are lost, that you don't know God, that you're still dead in trespasses and sin. That you have been found wanting. If your sin has found you out. If you know that you are guilty before God. If you know that you are a debtor and you have no way to pay. If you are at present a son of hell. 
that you've lived all your life rejecting Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the Saviour, the Lord. If you realise today that you're destitute and without hope in the world, what do you do? 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21 says this. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the plea. We beseech you. We beseech you in Christ's stead. Be reconciled to God. <coughs> Christ came to be sin for us. As we know, he knew no sin. For the reason that we might be made the righteousness of Christ in him. So again, I say this, if you're in him, if you're in him, Let's live holy for him. And I want to say this as well. That doesn't make your life perfect. It doesn't mean that you're going to wake up every morning full of oh, glorious worship to Christ. This is a struggle at times. Because you're all sat in these chairs in the body of death still. The body is dead due to sin. The spirit is life due to righteousness. Whose? Christ's righteousness, not yours. You're going to struggle with this body. You're going to struggle with this mind. You're going to sin. You're going to go to God. You're going to ask forgiveness. You're going to praise his name for forgiving you. You're going to get up. You're going to carry on. You're going to go again. You're going to fall. You're going to slip. He'll raise you up. You're going to carry on. Sometimes you'll pick this word up and it'll fill you with glory and wonder and praise. Other times you'll pick it up and it'll be like walking through mud. And it doesn't rely upon your works. It relies upon what Christ has done in you. Battle on, friends. Battle on. But we know the scripture says that ultimately the battle belongs to the Lord. And he has you if you're his. And he will not let your, your foot slip ultimately. So rest in him. Really, truly, please rest in him. Because he won't let you go. He won't let you go. But if you're not in him, and I'll say it again, I don't care how long you've been in church, you might just find yourself in the knowledge that you're not a Christian. Cling to him. Look to him. Be reconciled to him. And then I'll make you his righteousness as well. For his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this message of Peter. Thank you, Lord, that out of a multitude of people, 3,000 people heard in the very depths of who they are. And they saw all these things and they were almost wrecked. But you saved them. They saw what they were and that is a work of God. To see what we are without you. To see the darkness of our own hearts. To see the depravity of our human nature. To see the fact that, Lord God, we're at enmity with you and we don't want you. And yet in your grace and mercy and your love toward your people, nevertheless, you draw your people to yourself. And you save them. And you've saved us here this morning. We offer you our thanks and our thanks will never be enough for all that you've done and all that you are and sending your son and laying down his life for us and oh thank you Lord that he took it back up that he was raised 
for our justification. That that is proof that his sacrifice was accepted. And now we who were dead in sin are now alive in Christ. And I pray, Lord God, that if there's anybody here this morning who doesn't know you, Lord, take the wool from their eyes, I pray. Draw them to yourself. Speak life into their soul. And cause them to call and to cry out to you and to be reconciled to you. Lord, save amongst us, we pray. Save our families. Save those relatives and friends that we're praying for. Save our sons and daughters. Have mercy like you have had on us. Lord, glorify your name amongst us, I pray. Glorify your name amongst my brothers and sisters. Use them for your glory, I pray. Use them in their jobs. Use them in their friendship circles. Use them in their families. Speak life through them, we pray. Lord, we give our lives to you. Oh Lord, will you take them? As we commit them, will you take them? And will you do all according to your will with them? That on that day, when we stand before you, we'll hear those sweet words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into your rest and reward. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.